Hey, Genesis, thank you for having me. Um, particularly grateful to be here. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the EEOC and its mission, just for those of you that don't know. Um, so the EEOC is the federal agency that enforces the federal laws against discrimination in the workplace. Um, and we're dealing with individual job applicants or employees um, who have alleged to be discriminated against based on their race, color, religion, sex, national origin, age, uh, disability, and genetic information as well. And so the EEOC's mission uh, is to prevent and remedy unlawful employment discrimination and advance equal opportunity for all. How do we accomplish that? Uh, we have a great team of investigators uh, nationwide who are investigate uh, claims and charges that are filed at our agency, um, as well as a, a legal team or a legal unit that uh, handles the litigation of uh, certain cases, uh, which you've probably seen in the news, like EEOC versus such and such uh, company, uh, in an effort to combat workplace discrimination, uh, as well as protect the rights of not just individuals, but uh, the public at large, right? And so we also have an outreach and education pro uh, program that goes out and educates uh, employers and, and advocacy groups on the laws that we enforce, uh, as well as conducting respectful workplace trainings and things of that nature. And then uh, I oversee our New York District's mediation program, uh, which is a great program that offers uh, parties uh, to a charge the opportunity for a fair and efficient and cost-effective means uh, to resolve their disputes, usually pre-investigation uh, before that process takes hold and, and it's handled by a neutral uh, third party uh, mediator. So that's a little bit of kind of a, a in a nutshell, uh, what our agency looks like. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I've and I've seen firsthand the the hard work that you do. I, I remember in the beginning of my career, I got a chance to shadow you a few times and you all are you all are put in that work day in and day out uh, to help people. So it's it's um, inspiring to see. Thank you. Thank um, you. Yeah, of course. So just turning to the topic of um, individuals with disabilities. So, you know, I want to talk about on one hand, the legal, on the other hand, the ethical, but what are the obligations that mediation providers have to participants in the process? And we, we can tackle the legal part first and then talk about the ethical part in a minute. Excellent. So yeah, from a legal perspective, obviously understanding there's state and city laws that may apply as well. And under the federal laws, for instance, uh, mediation providers have the obligation to make their services accessible to persons with dis disabilities. So what does that look like? We have the ADA, we have the Rehabilitation Act that apply. Um, and for one, that would require covered employers to make a reasonable accommodation to individuals with disabilities to enjoy the equal, empl equal employment opportunities, right? So for example, uh, if an employer provides mediation of EEO disputes as a benefit or a privilege of employment, absent an undue hardship, uh, must provide a reasonable accommodation for that mediation. And then as it pertains to outside mediators, um, that obligation exists as well. For instance, the ADA covering public accommodations uh, would provide uh, that that mediator would provide auxiliary aids, effective communication, accessible services, um, absent an undue burden, or if it fundamentally alters the nature of the mediation uh, program. Um, so for example, the EEOC um, providing mediation services, we provide sign language interpreters for uh, mediations where uh, requested and a private solo mediator would also have a similar obligation. Um, and so in, in a more detailed example of that would be for instance, a party who's deaf requests that the mediator provide uh, computer assisted real time translation like CART uh, versus, uh, you know, a actual sign offering a sign language interpreter. And so there may be that dynamic. And then I would offer kind of a, a practical tip is not to assume because a party is deaf that they'd use a sign language interpreter, they may need CART to effectively participate uh, in a mediation process. So we offer that those services uh, at the EEOC. Um, from an did you want to uh, talk about ethical considerations as well, Genesis? Sure, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a number of guidelines out there. Uh, to name a few, um, I think one would consider using the broadest definition of disability uh, when deciding whether or not to provide an accommodation, uh, making sure that the mediator uh, themselves is competent in the area, knowing, you know, having knowledge of disabilities, access, um, disability law, 
uh, et cetera, and also maintaining confidentiality of disability related information um, as much as possible uh, in the mediation and in ranging access uh, to parties when conducting the mediation. Thank you. I, I think that that's all really important. And, and part of it, you know, what I'm hearing is that the question of um, do we do you need accommodations? Will, will you or anyone in your in your in your party need accommodations? Is an important one to have, and a lot of providers have that as a part of their intake. But sometimes individuals do not, and it sounds like it really should be a part of it to make sure that um, you know everyone has meaningful access to the process. Um, I just want to loop back it's to, to something you mentioned before, which is you talked about sign language, and you talked about um, not making an assumption that someone who's deaf might might want to use one one method or another, right? Um, how do you is, is it just as simple as as asking like okay, th this is asking someone exactly what they need? Is, is that is that is it as simple as that, or how do you find out this information? Mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's all about communication. At the EEOC, we have an intake process, so generally, by the time the case hits our desk in our mediation program. We generally have an idea of what an individual might need because we have people up front that are communicating with these individuals after they file a card. Uh, but certainly, um, again, one might not just assume uh, someone with a particular disability needs one type of an accommodation or not. It's all about effective communication. And our mediators do a great job, even when they receive a charge, of communicating uh, with the parties to find out what they may need to be able to fully participate in the process. Mm -hmm. And let me let me let me um, take a moment here and um, and talk a little bit about thinking about this this world more expansively. And so some people might think about individuals with disabilities and think only about physical disabilities, right? They may they may say, okay, I want to make sure that um, someone who has mobility um, issues can can get to our facility, or that someone um, you know that we have the proper room or or equipment for someone. But there are certainly other types of, of, um, of disabilities that you know that aren't just about mobility. Can you can you talk a little bit about um, about that and and some of the um, types of accommodations that you've been able to provide? Yeah, sure. So I'm assuming so we're dealing with somebody maybe with a particular disability around mental health. Um, I think one again, don't assume, right? We don't assume one isn't uh, you know have the competency, I guess, to engage in the mediation process. Uh, we certainly are very open uh, with parties and communicating with them and then potentially recommending that they uh, seek counsel or potentially have a family member in the mediation if necessarily necessary, whatever is necessary in order to effectively uh, facilitate the process. Um, for instance, an example, um, whereas we may have someone, a particular party, uh, who is suffering from some form of PTSD or trauma, anxiety related to the actual workplace, uh, the allegations of the discrimination that mm -hmm. uh, were brought up through the discrimination. Um, and certainly the feedback I've received in my own observations um, have been that, you know, for those particular individuals, um, they may not want to be in the same place as their employer. Now, obviously, we'll talk about the virtual landscape and how that's provided a safe space, but in the past, uh, and when we conduct in-person mediations, I may get a call from uh, counsel for that particular individual that says, hey, can we set up the mediation in such a way that we're not jumping right into a joint session? My client doesn't feel comfortable being in the joint session uh, with the employer given uh, what's, what's occurred. Um, and so I may accommodate that individual by potentially having them on another floor or setting up the mediation in such a way that they come early so that I can put them in their caucus room uh, early on. At the EEOC, generally mediations are conducted in a caucus format with very limited joint session. Uh, and as we see uh, the practice and employment discrimination cases have, um, you know, have, we've seen a, a, that joint sessions have been uh, basically done away with uh, an opening statements and things of that nature. So that's been the trend. So. Um, it's not unusual to potentially do away with the joint session, whether it's virtual or in person, um, to accommodate um, someone being able to deal with the stress or anxiety surrounding the process. 
Right. So it's it's not it's not just thinking about um, the physical landscape. It's about creating conditions in which people can meaningfully participate in mediation and um, making sure that people have the support they need, whether it's, you know, a program um, or or whether it's something physical um, like someone in the room. You know, other types of accommodations that that we've that we've heard about are, you know, sometimes many people may need um, captions on their screen or or someone to take notes. Um, you know, th there are so many different types of accommodations that that people might need. Um, you know, maybe someone who's who's had hip surgery, maybe they need different kinds of seats, right? Um, because it's quite painful for them to to sit in some of the seating that we have. And so, really, it's just about asking those questions to see what what do people need. Um, and so. Let me ask you this, David, what does it mean for the mediation process to be accessible to people with disabilities? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, as a mediator, personally, I've done a lot of mediations and whether or not somebody has a disability, I'm overly accommodating, right? Like I wanna make sure uh, folks are comfortable with my mediation process. Like for example, uh, we'll talk about like creative uh, accommodations. We had a party one time request a couch um, because of uh, having to manage this person's disability, they wanted to be able to lay down uh, in between caucus. Um, and, and that was perfectly fine. In this particular instance, we didn't have a couch at our office. And so we went to, we changed the location, right? We had no problem accommodating that. We ended up uh, conducting the mediation at the uh, individual's uh, attorney's office. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, but to be frank, you know, even if someone I think without a disability wanted to take a break or or lie down during one of my mediations, I'm like, hey, go ahead. Like, you know, let's uh, make sure that everybody's comfortable mm -hmm. uh, with the process in order to make it again a safe space and somewhere where everyone can participate fully. So, mm -hmm. I mean, what I'm hearing from you is that you're thinking about you. Obviously, you're asking people what they need. And then when they share what those needs are, you're thinking about resources. And so what are the resources you have at your disposal? Sometimes they're in your office. Sometimes mm -hmm. they're in someone else's office, right? But what yeah. you're putting, you're doing is you're putting all of your heads together to think about where those resources are and linking those resources with the people who need them for the session. That's right, Genesis. As long as you have good coffee at your office, I'm there. You know, it's not a problem, so. Um, well, don't tell people, but sometimes I drink instant. I know that that's awful here in, uh, in New York, but don't tell anyone. It's just between us. Um, between, well, between us and the you know 145 people that are here now. So, so. Correct, correct. <laughs> um, so let, let me ask you this. I, I just kind of want to turn to virtual mediation, right? Um, yeah. Looking back to COVID, were there any access issues back then? And, and you know, how was that dealt with? So uh, the answer is no. Uh, as of March 2020, at the wake of the pandemic, as many here uh, are aware, um, I see a, a number of attorneys that have used our program, uh, especially during the course of the pro pro, uh, pandemic, uh, but we converted to all virtual mediations um, and we didn't do any in-person mediations, obviously in consideration for the health and safety of our staff, as well as the well-being of, uh, of the public. Um, and so the benefit of video mediations, I find that it's actually facilitated, it's facilitated access to the process, right? In the past, if somebody maybe had a you know, disability related to mobility and ability to come to our office mm -hmm. uh, in person, even though you know, we had a policy, we wanted to do mediations in person, we could do the mediation telephonically, right? Uh, we didn't have like Zoom back then. And now we have Zoom and our mediators are now experts in facilitating video mediation. So we're actually better equipped uh, to facilitate, um, to accommodate and make sure that everybody could um, you know, engage in the process to the fullest extent. Um, so for a particular example, um, you know, during the pandemic, there were individuals that had uh, particular ailments that um, you know, made them susceptible to greater illness if they caught COVID, right? So traveling to our office was a no-no. Like we're not going to have anybody travel to our office to do so, but from the safety of their own home, uh, they were able to, to attend the first the mediation uh, by video. So, um, so that was great. And then as of December, 2022, we began offering in-person mediations again to our offices and our offices as well. And, and I have to say overwhelmingly uh, since that time, parties are now just preferring video mediations. I maybe have done a handful of 
in-person mediations in our entire district since uh, we started offering it again in December 2022. So video mediations are here to stay and they offer more uh, access to the process in my opinion. They do. I mean, you, you don't hear um, necessarily everyone clamoring to go back to in-person mediation because it does enable people to participate from wherever they feel comfortable and safe, you know, and, and in some circumstances, it's it's a it's a heavy lift to come down in person to an office. And sometimes if you need a support person, you're also paying for that person sometimes. And so it can be exactly. an expensive. Um, yeah. Yep. To, to, to do that and virtual provides access and kind of circumvents that a little bit um just anecdotally you know I've, I've talked to some people around the country and um we're still pretty heavy in virtual mediation here in new york but there are some parts of the country where it's more hybrid or people are getting back to in person more and more so it's it's an interesting um it's interesting to see what's happening across the country um, by region and what those expectations are. Absolutely. Um, and when we're talking about embracing the virtual mediation process, um, mm -hmm. what about, you know, you, you mentioned mental health before and making sure that people, um, that there are accommodations. How, how, how does the virtual process help with that? Well, I think, again, uh, when we talk about individual physical disabilities, obviously that virtual landscape provides greater access to the process, right? You can fully engage when you're face-to-face, -face, uh, you know, with the other side, we're in mediation via Zoom, whether or not in first person, uh, it provides uh, a much more effective process and then per, you know, per se, like doing by the phone. Uh, and then individuals who, um, and again, not, not assuming that they're enabled to, uh, to engage in the process or have particular stress surrounding uh, the mediation per se, but in communication with the mediator, when this is communicated, um, I think that the uh, virtual landscape provides a safer space for individuals who may, again, be dealing with trauma or anxiety that, comes, mm -hmm. that stems from the alleged discrimination, being they don't have to be in the same facility as their uh, as the employer, for instance. Um, and mm -hmm. so it does provide a safer space. You're in the comfort of your own home in many instances. Um, so parties are more comfortable, they're more relaxed, and we're able to focus and hone in on resolution. Um, and it, and it, again, it's all about providing a safe space for, for everyone that's participating in mediation. Mm -hmm. Let me, let me, let me ask you this. Um, you know, when, when you're talking about making sure that people feel safe and making sure that the environment is welcoming to them. It seems to me that you're also um, moving into the field of trauma-informed practices, right? Yeah. And so when we talk about that, we talk about, you know, and there are many def def definitions, but most approaches include understanding the impact of trauma, designing systems to support folks, and adopting pr adopting practices that you know don't re-traumatize people and and some of what you're talking about is also that I mean especially with the EOC you're talking about designing um, systems designing entrances designing spaces to make sure that people um, you know aren't re-traumatized can you talk a little bit more about you know maybe share some advice for people who are hearing more and more about trauma-informed practices but want to know what that means and, and what they should be thinking about. So I think, you know, it stems, you know, talking about trauma-informed practices and best practices. I think safety and transparency are two things that come, come to mind. Uh, and that's for everyone in the room, right? For all participants, uh, whether the individual employee is bringing the allegations, the employer representatives at the table, we want to make sure that we facilitate a safe space for everyone as well as being transparent. Again, our mediators are very open uh, with the parties. We, we make ourselves available prior to the mediation to answer any questions, assess, especially with pro se litigants. We let them know their right to have counsel present or potentially an outside party, which could be a family member, of course, with the consent of, of the other side as well. And everybody signs confidentiality agreements and um, certainly being transparent, open about the process within the confines of confidentiality, of course, um, but certainly having that safe space, whether we're in person or virtual, making sure that uh, individual who may have suffered some form of trauma uh, 
you know, is, is uh, prepared to, uh, pr you know, move forward with the process, fully engage in the process and feel safe at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Thank you, David. You know, I, I think part of what we're talking about too is the need for, you know, going back to that need for a robust pre-session communications, mm -hmm. whether that's a formal intake process or a questionnaire, whatever it looks like, but making sure that um, whatever pre-mediation session communications there are, you get as much information as possible so that you can so that you can set these things up so that you can plan as a mediator um, to make sure that people people can participate. Absolutely. Dan, we have a we have um David, we have a couple of questions. Um, one is from um, Dan Burstein. So he asked, um, I read that there's been an increase in discrimination claims related to mental health conditions filed with the EEOC. Um, have you seen that? Can you talk more about that? Um, that's, you know, and that may be uh, in terms of filings uh, in the mediation program. We've been dealing with those claims since I've been part of the program. Uh, I started as a staff mediator here in 2014, uh, but that's always been, you know, some of our, you know, upfront, you know, some, a lot of the cases that we've been dealing with since mm -hmm. its inception. So whether or not I have seen an increase in the mediation program, the answer to me would be, uh, no, it's, it's the same. And it's, and it's a lot of cases that we see uh, related to those claims. Mm -hmm. um, I have another question. It's it's a question that's that's a that's a little bit different. It's 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 about kind of recruitment of mediators and attracting mediators. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, one question is, does the EEOC or do you? Um, it may even be you writ large, like service providers, right? But do you seek people with individuals with disabilities to become part part of the roster or people with particularly, you know, related um, skills or experience with that? Yeah, so absolutely. So um, the federal government at large is very active in recruiting individuals with disabilities. You can go on usajobs.gov to see all of the opportunities that uh, are available. Um, and as for instance, um, being a military veteran myself, um, there is particular, there's veterans preference uh, and veterans preference for individual veterans with disabilities uh, towards, uh, towards the hiring process. Uh, we also have, and you can look on usajobs.gov, there are um, announcements related to recruiting individuals with uh, quote unquote schedule A. Uh, disabilities. So there is hiring preferences uh, throughout the federal government for individuals with disabilities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. And, and you know, one thing I can say, um, you know, just anecdotally, how, how we're talking about this in the ADR field ha has been changing. I've been, I've been coming to these events since they started and, and all over New York City. Um, mm -hmm. And we've, we've been, you know, every year we're, we're thinking, more deeply in expanding our definitions of what diversity means, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, I remember when I when I first started before my um, mediation career, um, I was a civil rights attorney and I worked at the Legal Aid Society, and our definitions internally about diversity um, grew to include certainly people with disabilities, but also veterans and mm -hmm. other things like that, right? Like we want as many people as we can who represent the country. Um, yeah. in there, right, and talking to people who are the country, right? Um, so I, I want to loop back to this topic of virtual mediation. I know that most mediations now are virtual. Are there any, on the flip side of it, are there any drawbacks to virtual mediation um, in, in, these types of, in these types of cases? I, I can imagine situations where um, mm -hmm you know, maybe employers might, um, you know, because they're, they're not interacting with people in person, right? Sometimes maybe they can maybe hold people at arm's length and when, when talking about some of the treatment that people received or something like that. I mean, ha have there been, been any drawbacks um, to, to the influx of virtual mediation? You know, the, the, the data, our survey results would suggest that there haven't been any distinctions or differences between in-person and virtual mediations, right? And I, mm -hmm. um, but I, I would say, I, I guess I'll make a personal statement, right? Because I think there's this huge recognition for how great virtual mediations 
far. But I don't think we should lose focus on human to human contact in person and how effective that may be because I leave it up to the uh, for to counsel for the parties, and and I have seen in the instances where the attorneys in a particular case said, "Look, we think this case should be done in person for various reasons," um, and I found those cases that were in person to be effective, very effective. And kudos to the representatives who called it and said, "Look, this is a case that needs to be in person for whatever reason." I could think of a case that I just had recently where, uh, you know, counsel for the charging party, the plaintiff and employee was adamant we did it in person, um, you know, out of uh, anticipation that, that his client just needed that in-person contact, that it was a very emotional situation. And I, I felt that. I felt that, con that, that, that moment in the room where I was really face-to-face -face able to go through the case, go through the strengths and weaknesses of the case and, and engaging in you know, all the things that we do in terms of asking questions, showing empathy and things of that nature. And, and genuinely, it, it, it really fostered and opened up the lines of communication with me and that individual. We connected, I was able to build a rapport and we were able to get the deal done. And I don't think that would have been accomplished virtually. Hmm. Uh, so I don't think we should lose focus as practitioners of the importance of in-person mediations in certain cases. While also utilizing this amazing resource that we now have and we've grown to love in, in this virtual landscape. So there has to be a balance and on a case-by-case -case basis, I would implore uh, representatives to, to make the right decision for, for their clients. So. Hmm. I mean, that's a really good point. Sometimes people do need that, that human interaction and sometimes um, talking about it through the screen may, maybe doesn't convey um, the depth of what happened the same way an in-person, you know, contact might. Um, and sometimes, you know, if, if the subject is a person's, um, you know, individual disabilities and the accommodations for their disability, I can imagine sometimes being in person um, and, and maybe sure. might, might help being able to explain um, some of those things too. Absolutely. Um, so I want to open it up to see if anyone has any questions um, for David. We're we're, we only have them for a few more minutes. And so I just want to make sure that um, if anyone has any questions for David or in general around this question of um, making sure that um, individual with disabilities have access to the mediation space, have access to the ADR space, any other questions or comments that, um, that people want to share? Hmm. I'm around. I'm I mean, sorry. if you want to... Direct I'm message having, me. Happy to. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm having uh, technical difficulty, so I tried to raise my hand and I couldn't. Um, I was curious as to know that when in mediation and ADR, you do provide the accommodation, but what are the requirements or what is the recommendation as far as the reasoning of why? Like we know there's different kinds of disabilities, but. Um, how do you approach the fact if there is, let's say, opposition from the other side and they're requesting a reason why? I guess mm -hmm. I know we, we all know that you do not necessarily need to disclose per, you know, the American Disabilities Act, but in mediation, what is the process or what has been your experience when providing the reasonable accommodation? And um, you just provide it without asking, or is that the Na standard? Na Naomi, I think I'm hearing a couple of a couple of um, a couple of points in your question, and thank you for sharing. Um, I'm hearing one which kind of relates to a question that's in the chat, which is that when people are um, asking for an accommodation, you know, how do you how do you get enough information, but um, avoid accidentally asking inappropriate questions. Like, where, where's that? Where's that line? Um, I think that's. I think that's part of what what you're asking for. Exactly, and especially with if there's opposition to providing the accommodation. Mm -hmm. And so, to that point, there's also a confidentiality aspect of it too. Um, and any any thoughts, David? So you're you're saying suggesting like let's say I don't know the individual needs like a third party representative with them for some reason. 
-hmm. And maybe that would be something I could see like the other side objecting to for confidentiality purposes. Um, I think it's all about communication. A lot of times in the cases that we deal with um, at the EEOC, it's an ADA claim. And so the underlying condition the employer is already aware of. Um, so there's not a necessarily an issue of, of confidentiality because the employer already knows, right? And so this person may, um, so that, and then it becomes a conversation of, well, uh, there's this third person that, that's going to be here, uh, but it's usually based on the underlying condition from the charge, um, you know, some sort of maybe learning disability or, or, uh, or the such, something like that, um, dealing with mental health or, or something like that. And so I've not had in my experience an objection uh, to that, usually folks are, are very open uh, to making sure that everyone has access to the process. Um, an instance, you know, from a mediation, a mediator's perspective, I've, I've not ever had to decline somebody's recommendation um, because they can be as simple as needing to take regular breaks throughout the mediation. Uh, for instance, maybe to, uh, to take some medications or, or something like that. And that's something that can be built into the mediation naturally without even the other side needing to know. Um, and especially in the caucus format, I'm spending 20 to 30 minutes with either side in caucus, sometimes longer. Um, and so it, the process, at least from the mediations I conduct with the caucus model lends itself to accommodating mm -hmm. uh, individuals without any disruption to the process uh, anyway. Um, and so, I mean, I could foresee a situation where potentially someone wants you to do something that may compromise the integrity of the mediation process. Uh, for instance, confidentiality, if someone wants to record the mediation session, mm -hmm. I haven't had this request, but um, it is in the materials. Um, you know, maybe there's an accommodation around that, um, you know, potentially assigning a note taker for that individual um, during the mediation process, but we're not going to record the mediation process out of respect for confidentiality. I mean, that could be an objection. Of course, I've never had to object to um, to an accommodation request, but mm -hmm. um, that's something I could think of where someone, um, you know, has a particular disability that, you know, you know, they have a hard, hard time understanding the process and they're like, well, uh, why don't you negotiate the settlement for me? You know what you're doing, go, you know, do what you need to do to get the deal done. Uh, and I'm like, whoa, I'm a neutral, I'm not your representative. And so in that instance, it's like, look, you know, um, you have the right to have counsel present, you know, and here's mm -hmm. a list of, um, you know, potential, um, you know, attorney, you know, attorney advocacy groups, uh, like, for instance, Neela uh, is one, like, uh, so, hey, here's Neela, here's a bar association uh, website that has an attorney referral service, why don't you try finding an attorney uh, that could represent you um, at the mediation and help you with some of these things, so I hope I answered the question. Yeah, I think I think what you're talking about, you're talking about a couple of things. So on one end, you're saying that because of its very nature at the EEOC, they're there often because of the accommodations for the disability. And so it's not necessarily an issue of, of maintaining the confidentiality around the disability, which I think might be separate from some private contexts, where mm -hmm. as a private mediator, you might be asking about accommodations people share that they need one. And then the other side may say, OK, why are we doing this? what is the basis of this, right? Um, and the mediator wanting to make sure to keep that person, that person's, um, the reasoning behind the, the accommodation private because, you know, that is confidential information. So there is kind of a separation sometimes because you have more information um, that's being shared in, in the EOC. Um, but what I'm also hearing from you too is that it can be, pretty easy to accommodate people, whether it's, you know, someone wrote lighting or access or sense or things like that. I mean, whatever people need to participate, you know, they should have. I, I have one. Oh, David, go ahead. Did you want to say something? Oh, no. I mean, I have another example and we talk about lighting, right? Like, so I had an, uh, an attorney for an employer who, you know, needed the lights lower because of some, some disability sensitivity to light. And we have dimmers in our conference room. So, uh, so I dim the light and that's how we handle the mediation session. So, you know, not a problem. It's, you know, it's, it's easy to try not to even over have to overthink these things. Right? Mm -hmm. you know. 
Um, I have I have one final question for you before we before we wrap up. Um, and this question um, is Norma's question that I just want to make sure we get back to. So this goes back to our discussion about which kinds of matters are better suited for in person or virtual. And so um, I think Norma's asking, what are some of the situations that might be better suited for in person if virtual is kind of the default now? Okay. Um, I mean, if there's any, I mean, one, I mean, it has nothing to do with disability, but if somebody has no, doesn't have access to the internet, obviously, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. in person, right? And so mediation, especially at the EEOC, is all about access, right? We want to make sure everyone has access to the program, whether or not they have a disability. Uh, but there may be instances, and again, this is communicated to me by counsel ahead of time, where um, someone may be, again, suffering, and, and it works both ways, I suppose, someone suffering from, you know, particular trauma or emotional distress that, you know, could feel safer by video may need that in-person contact, that face-to-face -face with somebody, you know, there may be something that could be, um, you know, facilitated. And again, we have access to that. But if it's communicated me, to me ahead of time, you know, I could work with the parties to make sure that we facilitate a safe space, even if it is in person, um, you know, and, and be transparent, answer any questions, you know, that may, uh, may occur. So, um, so that may be, you know, an instance. Um, I just haven't come across too much more outside of the scope of what I just discussed. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Genesis, if you have any thoughts. No, I mean, I think it's a case by case basis, you know? Um, and I, I, you know, and I think I just want to wrap up in a second. I think I haven't had my list of questions for you. And I think we talked a little bit about how, um, how a mediator can make sure the parties feel comfortable um, sharing their accommodation requests. I think we talked about that a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. My last question for you before, before we, we move on. Um, is, you know, what can an ADR, ADR organization do to better prepare their mediators to lead sessions with people of all abilities? Yeah, so the simple answer is training, right? So training, you know, in this area is critical, providing mentorship, apprenticeship programs, you know, so you could partner a less experienced mediator with someone who is experienced in these areas as it relates to the ADA uh, disability uh, cases. Uh, you know, you can give me a call if you want to chat about these issues outside of uh, the scope of this program here, the EEOC and in particular our mediation program, we do a lot of events like this. And so if you have a group of folks that, you know, want the EEOC to come by or mediators and we can explain that process, explain our experiences um, and how we manage these, uh, these particular issues as it relates to disability or anything else. Uh, you know, we're always open to, uh, to doing that. So we could do that virtually or in person. So um, thank you, David. So and, an and you, you know, you all, you all are in there, you're mediating every single day. Um, so you're, you, you have, you have a lot of stories. I remember when I met you, you're like, oh, I've mediated thousands of kids, thousands. Um, <laughs> but you know, you have, you have so much experience. Um, it's very inspiring. So David, thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. I don't, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but, but thank you so much. We really appreciate having you here. Yeah, thank you, Genesis. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate your time. Take care. Bye.